If you've come across My Faith with Homer and Pip, may I humbly ask you to spend some time with us because the gentleman you're about to hear from has a wonderful faith story, and I think we'll all be blessed by it. His name is Greg Marshall. He's an Emmy Award winning creative marketing executive at CI Design Inc., storyteller, brand builder. He is also the husband of Laura. He's a proud dad, a loving dad, and he is a godly man. And as always on My Faith with Homer and Pip, we're produced by the marvelous Brent Young, and we are ignited by the man who had the idea for our video cast, My Faith with Homer and Pip, the unbelievable Steve the Homer True. Stephen? Thanks, Tommy. This is great when uh, you want to talk to the person who has his own peg leg podcast kind of similar to what we do, and he describes himself as a, story, a storyteller. There's nothing better than asking a story from the storyteller. Uh, I don't know where to begin. I, I know enough about you, and I'm curious where you start. Not only just your faith, I feel like I'm talking to a minister, or your life, or what, of all that you carry and have, what you want to start with. Well, this is exciting, guys. I, I've, uh, I don't think I've really told my faith story outside of the church in this format um in, th in this and i guess on the depth that i might share it right now so this is kind of the uh a big a big deal for me to go into some pretty deep places of my own life and i, and I was thinking about that question of where where do i really start if i'm telling my story and i came to a point where i realized i have to talk about how my faith died in order to in order to talk about um, how it came to life and and for me that if it's all right for me to start <laughs> in a in a way back place i I remember the first time I had a thought about faith and it I was four years old and I remember my mom dropping me off at a camp for a week it was like day camp so you go home after the afternoon I think it was basically free daycare because we didn't go to church there or anything and I just remember having this moment where they were talking about the creator of the world loving you and I believed them this is kind of this weird memory of, of sitting there being like oh yeah that makes sense and I remember a year later at kindergarten I remember some kids talked about God and I said God is everywhere and this kid named Billy Taylor said is he in this chair and I said, yeah, I think so. And he's like, I'm going to sit on him. And I'm like, this is really strange. You know, these memories that come back to me. And then in first grade, for me, faith, I went to a Catholic school. And I was mesmerized by the smell of the sanctuary, of the artwork, the ritual. It was all really naturally appealing to me and beautiful. And then I remember one day in class, my, I, we, the teacher said a prayer and then they, they do the sign of the cross at the beginning and the end. Well, at the end of the prayer, I did the sign of the cross like the priest where my hand was like out in front. And, and the teacher screamed at me. She, she lit me up first grade. She's like, you're not a priest. Don't pretend like you're a priest. And I was like, well, okay. So this is another side of it that I hadn't experienced yet where I'm, I'm doing something wrong by expressing like a natural interest in it and this is where that was the beginning of the end for me and the worst probably the darkest moment of my faith early on I was in third grade and this is the this is the important part the sort of the inciting incident that sent me off on the adventure that that eventually led me to here is the priest of that church uh, in school came into my classroom and one of the last days of school and he said to my class, one of you has chosen to go to hell because he has decided to go to a public school where he's going to be treated bad by teachers and by students and there's graffiti on the walls and it's a terrible place and you all need to know that he's chosen to go to hell. And everybody knew it was me. And so I, I remember being really confused. Now, third grade, I was like nine years old. And I vividly remember what the room looked like, what he looked like. 
I remember looking at my teacher, Miss Shervaney, and she was she looked stunned. She looked like shocked. And the priest left. And I remember the only thought in my mind was graffiti? That sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. And so I remember he left. Um, the teacher came over to me. She kneeled down next to me. And I must have got I must have gotten out of my desk and she came over. She kneeled down because I remember I was standing and tears were streaming down her face. And she said that she was really going to miss me. And she said some other things, too. I think it was basically like, you know, good luck. You're going to be OK. But she ultimately said, like, I'm really going to miss you, Greg. And it was her way of saying that was wrong. Um, but when I, the thing that happened was I went to this new school. Wait, wait a minute. I got to interrupt one thing. Go ahead. She didn't say you need to know you're not going to hell. She, no, she kind of left that. She did it. It was a very, um, it, like, it was a very unhealthy, toxic environment where the, the priest who, by the way, was later murdered in this church, Father Coons. Um, he was he was spiritually emotionally abusive to me to my brother a big reason why a lot of people won't even consider faith anymore is how he conducted himself and some other stories came out later that are that are deeply disturbing it was a very it was a very uh, dangerous place to be and the teachers I think were either on board in a militant kind of way or they didn't last there very long. And the way looking back on it, I was thinking like, if you were a compassionate person, there's no way you could stay there more than a year or two because it was brutal. And when I went to when when I went to the, uh, but you know, she may not have said that, but her she embodied it, I think, and I intuitively received it. I believe I knew by her compassion that what I just experienced wasn't the reality of of how things ought to be. And, you know, I think I was so young that I didn't, I couldn't wrap my mind around what any of that meant anyways. I think I was, I tried to embody, like, internalize it on some level, but I was really just curious, what was the school going to be like? Because the priest, this guy who symbolizes God to me, or like access to God, just told me it was going to be awful, and people were going to be mean, and there's going to be graffiti on the walls. And I'm thinking, like, looking back now, I'm like, what movies were you watching? <laughs> that, that was your picture of a public school. But I went to the school, and uh, the teachers were super nice. The kids were really nice to me. And there was more kids, and they were really nice. And it was really clean, and there was no graffiti. And I think at that moment, it just shut off. Like, my bridge to this whole spiritual realm was a lie and I don't think it was a conscious shut off but I can I can look back and tell you that that room was lit because I was intuitively interested in the mystery of faith and that room was that light was shut off and it was off for several years and I ended up you know when you <laughs> You're in a cave and the light gets shut off. You got to feel your way through it, you know, and you trip and you fall. And I did a lot of that, just trying to feel my way through it. And I made a lot of poor decisions through high school, uh, a lot of good ones too, but ultimately had no time or interest in this, this category of faith. And I went to a catechism, uh, a pro religious program and even did the confirmation thing, but it meant nothing and it and it it was only a way for me to spend time with some other friends who also did not care at all and were working against the whole vibe of anything about god or about religion we were we were just not we were so disengaged and not interested that it wasn't even that we were against it we just saw it as utterly irrelevant and then i had this really uh powerful encounter with another priest where I had to do co confession where um, those of you who are watching and have never done Catholic confession, there's sort of a script you follow. You know, you go in this little space and there's a curtain and, or whatever the divider is between you and the priest, you say this script. 
And I knew the script, you know, because you had to know the script to get in there. So I, I got in there, different priest, totally different church at this time. And Excuse me. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been, and this is when you told the biggest lie ever. It has yeah. been like three weeks since my last confession, when it might have been three years. Uh, yeah. So back to your story. I just wanted to let you know everybody yeah. kind of remembers it and the first time when you're not sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because like part of you're done and it's like, wait, did I say all the sins? Like, I don't know if that was a sin. I think I just sinned and what I didn't say. And I think, I don't, I don't think I really said it the way it really happened. I definitely swore more than four times in the last month, <laughs> you know, like all that stuff. Uh, but anyways, Father Tom, the healthy antithesis to Father Coons, dropping names here. Father Tom, I started the script and he, he shocked me by saying, Greg, 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 stop. Do you mind if... Uh, I just remove this curtain and we just talk. And man, that threw me off, right? So I was like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Inside, I'm thinking, you're not supposed to do this. What are you about to do? I do not trust you. I do not trust this situation. He just moved the curtain and he's like, how are you doing? <laughs> we ended up having just a regular conversation. And I'm telling you, it was like in that dark room that I was in, it just, it allowed a little spark to fly where I was like, you know, okay, so you're a human, you have compassion, you have empathy. I don't have those, that vocabulary necessary, necessarily, but that, that allowed me to be open to maybe hearing from somebody. And that priest, he gave me a, a big fat green Bible. Father Time gave me a big green Bible. So time, time went on, you know, and I, I didn't change my life around. I didn't think about faith a whole lot more. I actually did some really crazy stuff between <laughs> after in that time frame, getting into college. And uh, I, my passion was music. And I was, I was, you know, into hip hop music and still am um, doing a lot of rapping, a lot of freestyling, performing, whatever I could to be around music. And it was at this point where um, I was really wanting to pursue that, no interest in faith. You know, I just had that little bit of a spark experience, but wasn't really interested. But one day, this guy, Kevin, who was a part of this crew of people that I was around, he, uh, he came to these basketball courts where we all hung out, and he, he told us that he had had a dream. I'm telling you, he sounded like he was on a perma trip, like he was tripping on something, like he was... He had taken some hallucinogenic drug and now he was out trying to communicate about what he saw. That's what it felt like. But he was saying that he had a dream and it was sort of this almost like battle experience between angels and demons and all these crazy things. And this angel came to him and said, you have a choice, essentially, like what to do with your life. And he woke up and he said he knew that he had to read the Bible and, and start thinking about this. And it all kind of clicked for him in a way that didn't make any sense to any of us. But he started preaching to us. And like I said, we thought he was crazy. Uh, but I could not deny the fact that he went from being a pretty arrogant and even violent at times person who I looked up to because he was tough. Like if I was with him, like at the mall or whatever, like I could pick a fight and like, and it wouldn't, I'd be, I'd, it wouldn't matter who it was with, you know, because because Kevin and a couple other guys were there. That's how I thought of him. But all of a sudden, he was like strumming a guitar in the park, singing hymns and like only being kind. <laughs> it's like, what in the heck? How did you, you know, it was like none of us really were able to articulate it, but it was stunning. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't deny what I was seeing. So, Time goes by and it really, it stirred my curiosity. And, and then one day another guy in that same crew asked me if I wanted to record music uh, in a real studio, which at that time we didn't have MacBooks to do recording on GarageBand. Like you had to go to a real studio and pay. And, and we, uh, he invited me to do this recording. And I was like, man, we got it. I'm excited. So I write some lyrics, I share them with him. And he said to me, this was a huge turning point for me. He said, now this is a guy who was like 
as an MC, a rapper, just brilliantly talented and talented in the sense of like, he could rip on you. He could say crude things, crazy things. It'd just be like shocking how clever he was <laughs> like in a pretty uh, stereotypical way of when you think of, of rap music being what some people think of it as. Um, he was amazing at clever and, and not in, you know, phrase godly or whatever. But man, I shared him, I shared my lyrics with him and he said, yeah, that's okay, Greg, but we're gonna, we wanna write something that's positive, something that glorifies God. I was like, what in the world? He's like, yeah, Kevin is gonna record with us. I'm like, Kevin, and now you? And he's like, yeah, and so is so-and-so, and this person, and I was like, man, I don't even know what you mean, like glorify God. Like for somebody who doesn't think about that stuff, who doesn't care about that stuff, that's like, that's gibberish. What in the heck are you talking about? But at that time, I was so desperate to get in the studio and experience it that I, I said, okay. I was like, I, I get, and I'm thinking like, I guess I gotta figure out what in the heck that means, you know? So I went and I, I got that big fat green Bible that Father Tom had given me. And I opened it up and I knew enough that there was two parts, an Old Testament and a New Testament. And I started in the New Testament in the book of Matthew. And I started reading this thing and it was awful. It was like the first chapter is a list of names. And I was thinking like, this is not a revolutionary piece of literature. This is ridiculous. But I kept pressing and literally because I wanted to record and I wanted to know like what's the vocabulary that these guys are using and what are the stories that they're pulling from and I read the whole gospel of Matthew and it was while reading that that I started to feel this stirring in my in my soul like some of the observations right away were I would read these things that Jesus did and said in my I would say out loud, I had no idea that that's what actually happened. No one's ever told me that story in that way. Or I didn't know that story was even in here. And I, I went to church and I was around this stuff, but it felt like I was reading this thing that no one had told me about. And so the, the, a second realization for me was how natural it was to to literally look at the ceiling and say so you so you did this this is what happened and i would think to myself why am i talking to someone in this space where i'm only used to talking to myself having my own thoughts my own insecurities hiding things and all of a sudden i found myself intuitively sharing my inner world with someone i didn't know but it felt familiar and it felt normal and it felt natural and so i was like man like this is this is this makes sense and it's strange it makes sense that this space if there is a god and if there is a divine source of all life and I'm somehow made as an overflow of that source, it would make sense that my inner world is meant for relationship, meant for space, not just for my own sort of obsessive thoughts and my own like things I wanna hide, but like to open that up felt so natural. And it doesn't feel natural for everybody. I just, I don't know why it, it happened for me that way. I think it was just the right timing. But you know, the thing that I realized that I loved about it, you know, <laughs> maybe pause for a second and see if there's any, anything that, I, any direction I should maybe take the story. But I, what I loved about it was I found myself, I would walk outside and see the world differently. I would look at people and wonder about their story and wonder about what their journey is like and wonder if they've ever experienced the, transformation of realizing that your life matters going from aimless and empty to whoa so how i spend my time today 
means something. And I'd look at people and wonder if they've ever experienced that. And I would look for clues from anybody. And I think what, what was ultimately happening that I didn't have language for was I was becoming a more curious and empathetic person. And I started just asking questions and wanting to learn. And that's when I realized what my potential was. I mean, I had never got above a C in English my entire life. And I had this experience with faith and I started becoming more curious in reading. And all of a sudden, I'm acing my way through a language and linguistics program in college. Like, how, how did that, where was that hidden, you know? It was all in me, but it just was, it wasn't coming out. And so I was realizing that I was way more talented than I realized. I was, had way more purpose than I ever realized. I was way more satisfied by being curious than by trying to convince people I'm amazing. And... I had a much more rich life being curious and pursuing other people who are different from me and asking questions and learning from them. And last thing I'll say about this season of my life and see if you have any, any questions or prompts for where to take it. Um, I became so curious. So Mondays I would do philosophy club. This was at UW Milwaukee. I do philosophy club on Mondays, Tuesdays I'd sometimes go to the Hillel group and listen to rabbi, talk about different things and interact with Jewish students. Wednesdays, I got together with a couple of guys from Saudi Arabia who were part of the Muslim Student Association, even ate like Ramadan dinner with them, um, but mostly talked about language and then, it would always be, then we'd always talk about faith in interesting ways. And then I was involved with Crew, used to be called Campus Crusade for Christ, now it's called Crew. I go there on Thursdays and my Christian roots, you know, that was where I favored, like I, I gotta explore this. And, uh, and then Fridays, I would sometimes do great books discussions with faculty and, and community members. I got a job at the library so that I could read whatever books were coming through. People were reading something on philosophy. I'd grab it because, well, it must be worthwhile because somebody took it out, checked it out. So I was just immersing myself, locking myself in my dorm room, reading and freestyle rapping for hours, just on loop for months, just <laughs> locking in. And uh, it, it uh, man, it sent me on such a beautiful adventure. And I feel like my journey has led me to identify very closely and intimately with Jesus. And the, what I've found is that um, I'm convicted that there is a divine source for all things. And at the heart of that divinity is, is community and relationship, which is why I, I, did, I lied about stopping at that point because this thought's coming to mind. Um, I found that, and I believe this is an evolution of my journey, and, um, but I found that I'm convicted that there is a divine source of all things, and at the heart of that divinity is relationship and community, which is why the Christian mystery and paradox of the Trinity is so beautiful to me, is because it's an attempt at explaining that God in and of himself, or God in and of itself, himself, is relationship is community and when i saw the freedom of uh what that meant for me and the beauty of what that meant for me and my relationships and my connections with other people i i was in wholesale um, and then i started to see weird things of people who grew up in different contexts were really anxious about other people believing something different from them and they couldn't enter in because they always felt like they had to change something about that person in order to have a relationship with them and for some reason, my just raw encounter with Jesus it led me to a place very different where I was like, oh, so you, your journey is totally different from mine. You're in a different place. I wonder where we're similar. I wonder where we're different. Where do we contradict each other? How do we love each other really well, even though we disagree? And how do we work together? And I was doing that in college. And it just it's kind of became a foundation for me that's continued and has led me on the path that I'm on now to do what I've done and be the person that I am. Oh, I have a ton of questions. I feel like I'm talking to, to uh, the feature and phenomenon, the movie with John Travolta. Like you had, you've had this fixation for some, one, some of all this information, um, but I'll direct it toward you're a storyteller, and we are now understand why. So the more stories that you discover, does it make you feel even that much more unique in yours? Does it make you understand yours better, or does it make you? wonder what the heck happened yeah 
It's a, I think, the most beautiful discoveries happen in paradoxes. And we truly do the paradox in this case, in one part of what you said, is that we really do find ourselves and our stories by being curious about other people's stories and learning what other people have gone through, what other people need, and we learn how to serve them and sort of wear other people's stories, like put their stories on us and allow their experience with the world to change the way I feel about the world, to change the way that I see things. And so the art or the practice of empathy, the practice of compassion, empathy being my ability to wear someone else's story long enough so that it changes my perspective, that shapes who I am. Compassion coming from the word passion, which means to suffer, suffer with, compassion, Compassion is the willingness to enter into someone else's world, their story, and even suffer alongside of them in order to serve them and to, to love them well. And so that also changes you. And so I found the more curious I am about other people, the more fully I become myself because my perspective is getting more well-rounded. So like in this political context that we're in right now, it's just absolutely bizarre to me to see people who say they're followers of Jesus not leading with empathy, not leading with compassion, but instead just buckling down on whatever rhetoric their cognitive framework feels most comfortable with, and whatever they've been most enculturated to, just buckling down and fighting for that perspective and being anxious and fearful of anyone else. And it's like, what in the world like i would expect that from somebody who doesn't understand the basic nature of reality which is flows from a divine source that is is love that is empathy that is compassion so i yeah i feel like uh, it's a lost art in many ways and it's it's a failure of many of us in in churches to not disciple people to be more empathetic and to be more compassionate. And I do think storytelling is a big part of it in the sense that, like I said, everybody has a story. And if I'm not willing to care about it enough to wear it, to suffer with, to understand or try to understand how they've suffered and what it's like to be them, I can't become a full version of myself. And I, and I would apply that in a, like a cosmic sense, like a big, we're talking some big terms of like human purpose, life, but it's also like, how do you do sales well? Well, sales is a process of like falling in love with another person, asking questions, being curious, not trying to sell a thing, but trying to understand what this person's life and world is really like. What do they actually want? And then you start, when you see the dots that they've put up on the wall, then you start to ask the question, how can I be valuable to the, to the dots that they put on the wall? How can I connect my dots to their dots? How can I be helpful? How does my story, who I am, serve this person's actual desires? And I can't connect those dots unless I've actually pursued them, identified with them, and gone out of my way to think of how I can serve them better. And that's true of marriage. It's true in sales. It's true if you want to know how do I do marketing on social media. Same thing. It's just, it's, it's in the very fabric of the universe that human beings flourish more fully when we pursue one another, identify with each other in deep ways, and then go out of our way to sacrificially love one another. And that's all about storytelling and, and story creating for ourselves. For those that are strong enough to want to do it, and I know you do some motivational speaking, what would you tell them or what would you do to try to put a faith into someone's life? You told us how it occurred with you, but what... Yeah. What do you think is the best way to touch people knowing that you were touched? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, in some ways unique for every single person, but the, the process is typically the same. Um, it's, it's unique in the sense that some people have had a positive experience with church and maybe just gave up on it and didn't see the relevance of it. And I say church is like maybe too, 
too uh, generic of a term, but a faith life or a spiritual experience. Some people have had a positive experience and are just kind of numb to it, feel like it's just, just irrelevant. And so talking, engaging, and having a relationship with that person is going to be different from having a relationship with somebody who was sexually abused by a priest or a pastor or somebody who has um, has watched their family get ridiculed and rejected by somebody of a faith, whether it be Christian or otherwise. And so because those relationships are very different, we have to lean on something more than a formula of how to communicate. We have to lean on a way of being, a way of relating to somebody, which is, a, which is the, I think, a mistake that most, a lot of churches make is they'll have like an evangelism course and it'll be about how to talk about your faith when really like we're, we're in like post post modernity. We're in a point where the old frameworks of meaning have been blown up. So the only hope of connecting with somebody is by relating with somebody in a way that embodies the ministry of Jesus, which it goes, it transcends what you say to somebody who's sort of warm to faith or somebody who's totally rejected it. It's, like, I don't know what to say to you until I've embodied what I've seen in the divine source himself, which is that Jesus, God in Christ, at least within the Christian narrative, is like, is, as I want to explain it right now, I think some people are ready to see it as a literal thing. Some people are at a point where they're like, I'm kind of open to thinking of it as a metaphor. And some of the people are like, that's just nonsense. I like to communicate about it in a way that's open. Every, everybody enter into what I'm saying however you want to. Um, but essentially, the story is that God pursued humanity through Christ, meaning God left the, the, the heavens and entered into our world. And then in Hebrews 4.15, it talks about how Jesus became a high priest that relates to all of our suffering and our temptations. Um, John talks about how he put on flesh, became human, and that's a statement of not just pursuing us but then deeply identifying with us. And then after he's identified with us, like became human, suffered alongside of us, even to the point of death, then there was this, that death becomes a sacrificial love that results in a new life that's possible. And so if I want to relate to somebody in a way that leads them towards a faith, a spark of hope that maybe they have a, that they're created with a purpose, and that their life means something beyond just what they accomplish, how much money they have, or how many friends they have, but your life transcends all of that. If I want somebody to get closer to that, it's not going to come from me choosing the right words necessarily. It's going to come from me pursuing them with humility, truly identifying with where they're really at in life, so that I can see the best ways to love them, knowing they may not they may not agree with me on these things. They may not see it the same way I do, but I know that then I am creating a connection with a human being that wouldn't have been there otherwise and a connection that's going to serve this person on their journey. And however Christ, the one through whom all things were made, is revealed to that person, it's not up for me to dictate. But if somebody wants to know what, who is this Jesus, like what do, you, what do you mean by him, like who was he, I can show people in scripture who he was and who he is for me and my own, my own relationship with him. But that's a long way of saying, I feel like it's more about how you relate to people embodying the way that Jesus related more so than saying all the right words. And there's a reason why that change that's important now in history, especially. I will defer to Tommy, but I do want to throw this in. It has nothing to do necessarily with my faith, but I love hearing memories that people have of when they were like in third grade or eight or nine. I want to ask you about all your memories, given how many years ago that was. Uh, any memory you have of your parents when you were seven? or Because uh, I think that they're just fascinating to me of all that's occurred in your life. It's as if that happened yesterday and you could go exactly to the spot and you could get, go exactly to where it occurred. And I don't, I don't know what those things are for other people. I know I have some as well. And that that part just, uh, I want more of your memories, but I'll, I'll save that for some other time. Tommy, you, you take it from here. Well, unless, unless Greg wants to share one, this is, this is looking like a two-parter depending on his busy schedule. Greg, anything you want to say to that? 
Oh man, I as, I mean, you talk about memories. There's and my parents. There's there's two quick things that I think are important. Number one, I was a surprise to my mom, the fourth fourth of four, and she wasn't expecting to to be pregnant with me. And so when she found out, she was really scared, and and they didn't have a lot of money and. Uh, it was a really, really tough time. And I, and my mom talks about, and I can vividly picture this though, obviously I wasn't there except being formed inside of her. But I, uh, I, she talks about like basically falling on her bed and crying and for the first time in her life, like really praying and being like, I don't, I don't think I, I don't know how to do this. And she just basically cried out for help. And I, I go back to that moment of like, here I am, like a terrifying pregnancy. And my mom at the end of herself, she just cries out for help. And I can just like, I kind of like to imagine God's hand just kind of being on my mom like, hey, it's going to be okay. And your son is going to do a ton of stupid stuff. He's going to, you're going to get calls from the police department multiple times before he's 17. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. But eventually, eventually it's, it's all good. You know, like, don't, don't worry. Like it's going to be okay. And there's been moments in my life. So like my faith, I think is an overflow of my mom's raw faith. And I've learned about my grandfather, my grandparents and great grandparents a little bit of like, little seeds of faith, you know, and I think there's people that have prayed for me to, and, and, and I can't, I received that, you know, people talk about valuing their ancestors and their ancestors stories. And uh, I think we, we could be wise to, to celebrate that even more. Cause I feel like that's a big part of why I'm where I am, but you guys, I should tell you in two part, maybe. Um, so in the midst of all this momentum in my life, when I was 19, 20 years old, um, I thought everything was starting to make sense to me. And then as a, on September 3rd of the year 2000, I had a seizure, nearly killed me. A virus was attacking my brain and my spinal cord and I lost the ability to walk. In the midst of feeling like, ah, oh, my life has purpose. And I'm realizing there's a divine source of things and I have, there's a plan for my life maybe. And then all of a sudden, boom, I'm in a hospital and I can't feel my legs. <laughs> so. What, like that, that process was insane, but then it was uh, part of my parents' story. You talked about my parents. Oh, wait, week. I want to know what you thought and communicated with God at that time. I think that's, I think that's, <laughs> that's maybe worth a part two. All right, uh, okay. But, but I will tell you that when it happened, you know, waking up, I had a seizure in the hospital for a week. They sent me home because they couldn't figure out what it was. I woke up the next morning and I couldn't feel my legs, but I could kind of walk. And so I put, I told my sister, who was the only one home, something was wrong. She said, well, I'll take you to the doctor. I changed my clothes. I looked down and I had wet myself and I didn't even know it. So I couldn't feel my legs, couldn't control my bladder, couldn't even feel that I was wet. It's a 20 year old who just became excited about the, the idea that I had purpose and that God loved me. <laughs> and so I, that momentum of my faith was really powerful. I was in the hospital connected to tubes, four spinal taps in the course of like 20 days. Uh, just tons of like re tests being done on me. People would walk in the hospital room and just start crying because of how I looked. But I, I had this like undying belief that I was going to be okay and God has a purpose for this. And I remember some, one time somebody said, I'm praying for you. And I was like, oh, I'm good. Don't pray for me. Pray for other people who really need it. Like there's a chance God won't take my legs, won't give me my legs back. And if he doesn't, then I'm probably just going to be like a really good motivational speaker about not giving up. Like literally I'm saying this stuff, but then some stuff happened where it just, I wore out and I reached the end of myself. And eventually all I could say to God was like, I don't have, I, I'm not okay. I had no energy to say anything other than I'm not okay. I don't know what to do. I'm at the end of myself. I'm humiliated. I'm broken. I just don't, I don't get it. I don't understand. And I wasn't resentful towards God for some reason, um, but definitely 
was a, a, a special point in my journey, a special low point. All right, hold on. Tommy, we got to stop it there because the ant, the rest of the story is one of the great teases ever. Even the storyteller will have to admit it. Um, yeah, I don't want to say anything. I, I will only say one thing. I would be convinced that if I were you, that when I die, that I would think God's going to say, I did a pretty good job with you when you had that problem, didn't I? I did a good job there for you, didn't I? You give me a little thumbs up there. Because I think there's, there in some ways can be no, ex there's just no other explanation. I mean, you know, people that have gone through that, it, it destroys them. They never recover or it just beats them up for the rest of their life. And he, he just took care of you. There's no other way. I mean, if you had not had that strength before that occurred, how would have that whole thing gone? Yeah, I really don't know, but I know that uh, all that I leaned on was a knowing that I was not alone in the universe. And I've kept, I keep going back to it because there's, as life goes on, there's so many disillusionment points and there's so many surprises. And um, the one constant has been that I know I am part of a cosmic story that's much larger than myself. And the most fruitful way to, to live my story is by attempting to embody the love that I believe God has revealed in the person of Jesus. Greg, whether it be moving into the city, let me just ask this as we close here for now with great gratitude with Laura and the kids um, having a heart for our African-American brothers and sisters while still trying to let people know that we should support the police in these very, very difficult times for someone who loves and serves and connects people in the midst of all the disunity. Has your faith been tested? And would you have a message for others out there who perhaps their faith has been tested? And if anyone has been contemplating faith, saying, what's it all about? This just isn't for me. Not under these circumstances. There can't be a God. Yeah. I, I can't say that my faith, my faith has been tested in some ways, not in a foundational, fundamental way, but my faith in the institutions that organize our faith conversations my faith in that has been has been really tested i'm deeply disappointed by many christians who have used no have put no effort into empathy towards the black community in understanding what is the cry for justice coming from what do people really mean by black lives matter and not just writing it off because on the uh, somebody is part of the organization had a pro-choice message or a pro-transgender message or some other whatever hot topic that people want to be fearful of and and um feel anxious about and and wholesale reject an entire people because of some fine print or some theme and I understand those things are important and I don't want to, those are important conversations, but I'm, I've been deeply saddened by an inability to acknowledge that for over 400 years, the African American community has been systematically oppressed. And there are systems in place now that's, that are remnants that are still causing problems system, systematically, but also individual cultural ethos that, that people live in, and it's profound. I mean, a friend of mine, his son is 19, just got his license. We've been talking about this. Um, in the last three months, his 19-year-old son, who bought a new car, a red Mustang, saved up an awesome kid, young black, uh, pretty big kid, plays college football, kindest, most gentlest human you're gonna meet, except on the football field. He's been pulled over 10 times in the last three months and never given a ticket. Never gets pulled over in Milwaukee, but as soon as he leaves Milwaukee proper, if you go to Wauwatosa or uh, New Berlin or Mequon or you name it, like he knows he's going to get pulled over. At least it's a good chance. And every time they ask him, nice car, how'd you pay for this? Every time. And then they say things like, yeah, I just want to make sure you don't have any drugs and alcohol in the car. The last person, the last officer who pulled him over in New Berlin, he asked the officer, why, 
why, what did I do wrong? And she said, well, when I flashed my lights, you pulled over without using your blinker. What? You mean after? And he's like, okay, I'm sorry. I thought I just tried to get over as quick as I can. Is there anything else? Do you have drugs and alcohol? No. Do you want to search my car? No. I just want to make sure you don't have drugs and alcohol. Nice car. How'd you pay for this? And I was like, oh, it's, and he, and to him, it's so normal. So anyways, I could tell stories for like, for hours about, you know, dozens of black families that I'm in relationship with uh, and the countless stories. And it's like, and this is the last thing I'll say is like, my heart is broken over how deeply entrenched political rhetoric has become with people's Christian theology and faith perspective. And people don't even see it anymore. And if you know it's there if it's robbed a person of empathy. If they have not asked questions and sought to understand in a deep way, and I've witnessed some of that too, but you know when somebody's civic religion is intertwined with their Christian faith, when there is very little empathy and a ton of defensiveness, and that has just been so prevalent. And my, my hope and my desire is that the church will begin, and I mean everybody, evangelical, Catholic, across the board, and even outside of the Christian faith, Jewish, Muslim, outside of religion altogether, that we would make a high priority of actually listening to each other so we can get out of this weird algorithm that we're all caught in. So yeah, my faith has been tested in the sense that I'm doubting, I've doubted the validity of how churches have gone about growing people and helping people grow in their faith. Well, we, we can't thank you enough for your faith, for the fact that you are in relationship, and I think being used of the Lord that way. So Greg Marshall, I'm with Homer. Uh, hopefully we'll have another opportunity to continue because there are a lot of different ways to go. But this has been a real gift, and I, and I suspect that anyone listening to and seeing you has or will be blessed by this. Appreciate it. Thanks for the chance to, to talk with you guys. You bet. He is Greg Marshall. And uh, if you have an idea for a guest, everybody, please email me, pippinstom at yahoo.com, P-I-P-I, -I, N as in Nancy, E-S, Tom at yahoo.com. For our special guest, Greg Marshall, our good friend, Steve the Homer True and producer, Brent Yunk, I'm Tom Pippins. This has been My Faith with Homer and Pip. Have a great one, everybody, and God bless. We hope to see you again soon.